My guest today on 06880, the podcast, is Lou Weinberg. Many Westporters know him. Lou is a director of and the driving force behind the Westport Community Gardens. So that's the amazing plot just south of Longlots Elementary School, where 100 gardeners grow fruits, vegetables, flowers, herbs, and they come together as part of a wonderful multi-general, sorry, multi-generational community. On the perimeter of the gardens, Lou has created the Longlots Preserve. He and many helpers have gotten rid of invasive species and their place is a native New England forest, part of the pollinator pathway, and like gardens themselves, it's a beautiful reminder of the power and the magic of all living things. So welcome, Lou, to 06880, the podcast. Thanks, Dan. Give us the backstory. You're, you're passionate about the gardens, and I know uh, everybody watching this will pick up on that passion. Uh, you know a ton about the environment. You're an amazing wildlife photographer. So, you know, where did this interest come from, and, and how did you learn so much? It's a great question, and I'm not sure. Um, some of these things as we develop through life and as we grow just come out naturally. Um, I was a, uh, always a young kid watching my mother garden, and I was always asked to help. Um, I enjoyed helping my mother, but I never really grew a passion for the nature and the natural world until I um, became a environmental studies major at college. I went to Vassar College and uh, did an independent major in environmental studies and then started meeting other people, as, one is, as one's prone to do in college. And I started backpacking a lot all over the country and then all over the world. And for some reason, I'm just drawn to the ability of the natural world to bring out the best in people. Um, I find it extremely attractive uh, aesthetically, um, emotionally, spiritually. And uh, then I began my studies and I realized just how intertwined everything is. You know, everything is connected is the mantra. And um, I realized that the natural world is completely dominant in our life and we depend on it so desperately. And the healthier the natural world is and the more wonderful it is, the better off we are. So it really formulated in college and then thereafter. And then I moved to uh, Minnesota after living in New York for 10 years and uh, grew a garden out there and it just poured out of me. I don't know what happened, but it, you know, there was a lawn there and then all of a sudden there was a, a Midwestern wildlife flower garden and it was incredible. And so I brought that with me back home, Connecticut. And, and how did you wind up at the, at the gardens? And how, did you just discover it? And, and once you got there, what, what kept you there? Um, the gardens before my time, I moved here in 1999, back here in 1999, and the gardens had been taken away from the gardeners to build the Bedford Middle School. I believe they called it the Nike site. And there hadn't been a garden for approximately six years, and then... Uh, the Jaeger flower property adjacent to Longlots Elementary School came up for sale and the town bought it. And Diane Farrell was the select woman at the time and appropriated that land for a community garden, a parking lot and a soccer field. And they built the parking lot, they built the community garden. And um, I went to a meeting of the uh, incarnation of the new community garden. Uh, it was here at the library. And because I lived in the neighborhood and uh, it, you know, I had found that passion for growing things and being connected to land. Um, and I went to the meeting and when it came time uh, for everybody to decide who was gonna run, of the, run the garden, nobody raised their hands, so I did. So I walked away as the chairman and that began this 20 year journey. For, for people watching this who don't know the gardens, how do you describe it? What are the community gardens? Well, I would describe it as fabric of the community. You've got now about 120 members, all families who live in town or work in town, and they come and they go at a slower pace. Um, they interact with each other. They meet new people. So when you go to Stop and Shop or anywhere else in town, you're seeing now people you would, you would not have known before. So fabric of the community is really the driving force that keeps the garden alive. People are very, very connected to this property. They love it with a passion and they pass that passion on to their guests and their neighbors by bringing flowers and produce to them. 
Uh, additionally, it's a magical place. Everybody seems to love the flight of the bumblebee. Everybody seems to love the beautiful yellow swallowtail uh, butterfly. Everybody seems to love the, the, the Carolina wren and its song. Well, they need a place to grow and they need a place to flourish. This is that place. We have an incredible amount of biodiversity there. It's an unbelievably magical, beautiful place to sit, relax, slow down, and become connected with yourself, your family, and the community that you live in. How many plots? A hundred? Over a hundred. And right in the middle, there's places to sort of gather and... Community space. We have several community spaces. One um, is our main space. We have a 10-foot long picnic table there. It's under a uh, pergola that was built by an Eagle Scout. Um, it has grapevines all over it. Um, Nick Mancini's a master gardener. He helps grow those grapes. Uh, Lou Rolla uh, helps us keep them alive. Um, you know, everybody, everybody's a part of this. That's, you know, really the main driving force that keeps it alive. Um, but we're, you know, we're surrounded by um, uh, uh, knockout roses and hundreds of daffodils. We've got right now in bloom St. John's wort and it's covered in bees, absolutely humming with bees. I could show you the video in the background is nothing but hum. Uh, so pollinator pathway, think that way. But it's a gathering space. People eat dinner there. People eat lunch there. People do business there. People come and just sit and relax and slow down. It's a absolutely magical common space that brings people together. And it's next to our bocce court, which we have a tournament on every <laughs> year. Um, and we have a big trophy and it's a celebration. And it also, it's again, fabric of the community. You meet new people at the garden that you didn't know before through the bocce tournament. A lot of fun. Young, how young, how old? We've got five to 95. Chris, Singer's, uh, Chris Singer is our oldest gardener. She's an original garden member, one of the most wonderful human beings you'll ever meet. We have the nicest people in town at this garden. And uh, she's been there forever. And I'd like to add that we help each other. You know, Chris can't manage a 10 by 40 plot by herself. So as part of your work hours, and we require a whole three hours of work hours from every member every year, is we dedicate to helping out our members who can't particularly help themselves fully. So, you know, Chris is 95, and then we've got a million kids in there. And kids, you know, I'm a teacher, so I've always been drawn to kids. I really adore them. I have a great time with them. I love listening to them. I love answering their questions and engaging them. And when you see kids come into this garden, and you see them run to the plot to see what they're going to get to pick next. It is absolutely a joyous experience. What's your favorite part? Of the garden? You, yeah, your, your, your go-to place. <sighs> um, it's respite. You know, uh, this town is getting very built up, particularly since COVID. Um, traffic is unimaginable. Um, just, you know, cross town traffic, you're a music guy. I'm driving here to get here and all I'm thinking is Jimi Hendrix cross town traffic. <laughs> so hard to get through to you. Um, it's a place of respite. It's far enough away from 95. It's far enough away from the merits. So you don't hear that drone too often. Um, it's off the post road, but uh, far enough away. So you don't typically hear the drone from that as well. And it's quiet. It's just quiet. It's an opportunity to slow down. And slowing down often is what people I think need in order to reconnect with themselves and figure out who they are, where they've been and where they're going. Uh, grow a row. Yes, Amy Nickwitz, driving force. Tell us about that. Uh, grow a row is um, Amy's brainchild. And the idea is to get um, freshly grown produce to the food insecure. Um, she's done a remarkable job of promoting it. She's done a remarkable job of incorporating it into the Westport Community Gardens. To that effect, we have a big cooler in one of our common shady spaces. And um, we send out emails to membership all the time to donate on pickup days. And we gather the significant amount of produce um, and donate it to those who are food insecure. So that goes, I believe, through one of the churches in town and then it gets to a food rescue and it goes out into the community and it's a, an absolutely wonderful opportunity to get fresh food to people. It's also a phenomenal educational tool. And the Long Lots Preserve. Ah, the Long Lots Preserve. <laughs> so the Long Lots Preserve is an area surrounding the Westport Community Gardens. It is town owned land that was neglected since 2001 when the um, town bought the property from the Jaegers. Um, it's filled, it was filled with garbage and it's 
completely filled with invasives. And I don't know if anybody in your listenership knows about invasive species, but we've all seen the, the vines climbing the trees and killing them and strangling them. Then there's a million other things. There's bittersweet, which everybody knows about. There's mugwort, there's mile a minute vine, there's uh, uh, porcelain berry, there's garlic mustard, there's uh, knotweed, there's stilt grass, and it's littered throughout the area. It's just everywhere. And what we're doing is reclaiming the property and introducing native New England species to, to reclaim the area. It's a model, an absolute model of open space suburban rehabilitation in a densely uh, residential area. Um, so we're really excited about it because we're planting, we've got three or four phases done. It's a three year, three, four phase, two year program. We are on schedule to finish it in, this fall and we're um, under budget. And we've got three phases um, that include uh, incredible amounts, over 200 uh, trees and shrubs, uh, wildflowers of all different varieties. And biodiversity is the word of the day here because when you introduce native species and they're biodiverse, you attract a lot of different kinds of pollinators. And when you attract a lot of different kinds of pollinators, you create um, a, a sound, what we call ecosystem, um, where there's a uh, transfer of energy from photosynthesis and plants all the way up through uh, the top level predators. And this particular preserve has so much biodiversity, it's brimming with life right now. And we've got um, keystone species such as five different species of oak. We've got swamp white oak, scarlet oak, pin oak, swamp white oak, and northern red oak. We've got tupelo trees, we've got white birch trees, we've got sycamore, we've got hawthorn, we've got uh, hornbeam, we've got fringe trees, we've got, uh, we've got um, I, red bud, we've got, I mean, just phenomenal quantity of trees, but then there's the shrubs that nobody knows about because we don't have them around anymore. Button bush. Um, my favorite is uh, witch hazel because it used to be an industry in town, uh, and not in town, in the state, a big industry uh, where you extract the, uh, the, the material from the witch hazel plant and you make that astringent we all used to put on our cuts. Um, and we've got hazelnut in there, we've got blueberry in there, and we've got summer sweet and pepper bush and clethra. And I mean, just it's a phenomenal thing. I encourage everybody in town to come visit the Long Lots Preserve. It is nothing short of amazing. And we're, we're going to win that battle. And we, we also are doing another thing in there that really blows my mind is that at the turn of the century, there were about 4 billion chestnut trees, American chestnut trees, uh, that extended from the, uh, you know, Maine to Florida. And they said that you could take a squirrel and have the squirrel travel from the tops of the trees all the way from Maine to Florida without touching the ground. And then the blight came and it wiped out the American chestnut tree. And that devastated local ecosystems, native, uh, native forest, um, and a great food source for wildlife. And um, there was a stand, I believe, in Ohio where that wasn't affected by the blight. And so they've taken the DNA from those trees and they've taken 95% American chestnut DNA and combined it with 5% Chinese DNA and they've made a chestnut tree that's blight resistant. Uh, the, the one that I bought from a nursery in Georgia is called uh, the um, Revival Chestnut. And we've got four of them in there. They came in five foot sticks with no leaves on them, bare root surrounded by some gel to keep them alive. And, you know, it's an experiment, you know, science experiment. Um, and we're employing the scientific method and putting them in the ground and testing them and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, and we're um, growing them. They're now flourishing. I can send you a picture of these later if you'd like. Um, they're flourishing. And if we are able to propagate American chestnut here, it'll be a real feather in the cap, not just for the preserve, but for the town. And uh, a lot of the work was contributed, right? I mean, this is another volunteer community work. effort. It's all volunteer work. The in-kind services has been provided by, um, you know, Robbie Guimond started us off by leveling some land. Sir Development has leveled some land. Um, AJ Penna does anything and everything you want him to. They're a wonderful organization. Birch Tree Service, uh, um, Bartlett Tree Experts, um, Audubon, Aspatuck, Earth Place, um, uh, Sustainable Connecticut, uh, the State Forester, uh, the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection and Energy. I mean, everybody has got their hand in this because many hands make for light work and it takes a village. So if everybody does their little bit, you can create these beautiful places like this. Then you have the gardeners and you have other town residents who step in and provide some of the labor. Um, then we have the donations and the donations were matched by Sustainable Connecticut. We've raised $40,000, all volunteer. 
all donations, every single bit. Uh, let me, one caveat, we did get a grant of $3,000 from the state urban small uh, forestry grant. And that was wonderful to get also because part of that was matched by Sustainable Connecticut. It's an amazing community uh, story and it's endangered. It is. Um, right now they're uh, building or they're considering building or uh, rehabilitating Long Lots Elementary School. Um, and uh, some of the plans that they're considering uh, adversely affect the community gardens and the preserve. Yes. Want to talk a bit more about what what's involved, what's at stake, and why it's important? Well, yes. I mean, um, my concern is that um, as stakeholders on the property, um, we've had limited uh, participation to date. Um, and we're trying to increase our participation in the process. Um, the Westport Public Schools are a phenomenal system. And Nothing makes me happier than to read your blog and find out who went through the public schools here and are doing great things in the world. Um, I enjoy going to Staples and watching the baseball team played. I went to the semifinal, another great game. Um, I love the schools. My daughter went through the schools. We have gardeners that went through the schools. The schools are a, a, a gem of the town. What we would like to see is a consideration for the garden and the preserve so that we can grow together. We would like to see Long Lots Elementary School either get rehabilitated, replaced, um, and while simultaneously protecting the gardens and the preserve, which are two legacy town assets that will be here for the next hundred years, providing services to the town, assets to the town. Um, and I think we can grow together. We can definitely grow together. It's just a matter of whether or not we have the wherewithal to make that happen. So we're very concerned about the, uh, the, the existence of this incredibly wonderful and beautiful town assets. What would be lost if the gardens were replaced by a parking lot or athletic fields or a staging area for uh, Well, for a few things, fabric of the community. You've got a thriving community there, 120 families, and it's not just them. Again, it's their, it's their guests that come, and we have a lot of guests that come. It's the uh, people that live in their neighborhoods who know them and are invited to come or uh, reap the benefits of the produce. Um, it's Grow a Row. It's the Westport Garden Club who we donate um, a plot to so that they can grow uh, plants there for their plant sale and raise money for the absolutely wonderful things the Garden Club does around town. It's a pollinator pathway. It complements uh, Aspetuck's Green Corridor. Um, it uh, complements the town's plan of environmental conservation. Uh, it um, provides unlimited volunteer opportunities, and it is a remarkable wealth of opportunity to educate the town's children there at very little cost and introduce them um, without busing them anywhere to the great concepts of photosynthesis, water cycles, nitrogen cycles, carbon cycles, um, food chains, f food webs. I mean, it's just a massive wealth of environmental information uh, for kids that um, is in becoming increasingly important. It looks like the earth is falling apart at the seams. What kind of message are we gonna send to the kids if we destroy a property like this when we have the opportunity to educate them with a property like this? And it's not just science. It's you can take kids out there and do art in the garden. You can do art in the preserve. You could write objective and subjective uh, essays about your experience uh, with the land and nature. I mean, it's, it's really unlimited. It's an agricultural history. You can write a history of the property and interview the Jaegers. I mean, it, it, it really has unlimited potential. You're losing a lot. You're losing fabric of the community. Do you get a sense as, as you're talking about this and talking about it to other people that how much of the town knows about the community gardens or is it sort of a, We've a always, secret among the people great who garden question. there? We've always flown under the radar. We're a community garden, um, but we're a real significant asset. And that really hasn't come to the forefront until th this threat has emerged. So we are um, inviting everybody that we can to come see what this facility is. Um, it, not just a facility, this asset. Um, and it's not, it, to see that it's not a mound of dirt. 
you know, there's a bocce court in there. There's a pergola with uh, uh, grapevines on there that are old. It's 15 years old, the, the grapevines. The place is 20 years old. We're having our town party this year um, to celebrate our 20th year. We have a, a real um, composting facility in there where we take care of all of our own uh, waste. Um, we've got common spaces in there, picnic tables in there. We've got a wood chip situation in there. That's our, basically our asphalt for our roads. Um, we've got three layers of fencing to protect us from Groundhog Slim and his cohorts. Um, we've got deer fencing in there. I mean, this is a real significant operation. It is not something that's just a mound of dirt that you can move. We've got deep roots there. So to speak. So uh, as, as people learn about it, uh, I, I'm sure the people have reached out to you and say, said, you know, I, I hear the community gardens are in danger. Can I take a look? Yeah. Uh, what do they say? What's the typical if reaction? If you visit this place, everybody I've shown, and I've shown dozens of people in the last two weeks, everybody's blown away by it. People who have not been there before, even people who are, are there for 20 years go to this place, and it's, it's magical, absolutely magical. And the people who visit this place, uh, I had some people come after I did a Sunrise Rotary presentation on the history and the, um, uh, the, the, how the gardens and the preserve grew. And the response was phenomenal and people came to visit and they got to see this place that they didn't know about and everyone is blown away. Channel 12 has come out and done multiple stories on it and their people are blown away. Everybody's blown away by this place because it is that much of a wonderful part of a community. And there's only one. There's one community garden. Uh, any stories you want to share? Any, anything that, you know, any moments or people or events or types of produce uh, that say to you, you know, there, this there, is why we do what we do. There's a million stories. I mean, I know every inch of that place. I've been running it for 20 years. There's a story behind every inch of that garden. And almost every inch of that garden is, is used by a member of our community. And they all have stories. And they're the, some of the nicest people in town. And they go there to fill their hearts. And that's really my takeaway from it. It really creates a sense of community and it creates a sense of strength. People really go there to, 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 um, uh, to fill their souls. And um, I'm constantly talking to people and constantly hearing stories about weddings, hearing about funerals, hearing about people who are sick people who rely on the garden because they're sad, people who rely on the garden because a family member just died and they go to the garden to heal. It's a very much of a healing place. If I could deliver any story, it would be that. This is very much a place of healing. There's stories about the bocce tournament, which are final, with kids beating adults. Um, there's stories about uh, people finding great satisfaction in being able to donate food. Uh, people exchange information all the time. They're about how to grow food. You know, shouldn't we be teaching kids about how to grow our food? But one of my favorite recent stories is we've got, um, we've taken care of Groundhog Slim, right? We've put in uh, hardware fabric, which is hardware cloth. I've learned more about, you know, groundhogs than I ever dreamed of. Um, we've taken care of the deer with agricultural fencing. This year we've had an explosion and probably many of our town residents have had a, a, a issues uh, with rabbits this year, um, seeing more and more of them. And I do believe because of the preserve that we built for the first time in 20 years and because of the rabbit population, um, we were um, in the garden the other day and my wife saw two furry balls stuck together uh, running across the garden. And um, she looked and she didn't know what they were. They were attached to each other somehow. And then she looked a little bit closer and it was an animal carrying another animal. And we looked it up and we discovered that we now have a new sheriff in town. And that is a short-tailed weasel which had a rabbit by the throat. And so, you know, a great example of if you keep open space available, nature will fill it and it will fill it in a very magical and very balanced way. And so we have a new sheriff in town, he's adorable and he's helping control our rabbit population. Wow. But we have stories like that all the time. Um, you've got to come by again. I know you've been several times, but we are now in full bloom. Um, the zucchinis are coming in, the yellow squash are coming in, the cucumbers are coming in, the garlic's coming in, the tomatoes are coming in, and it's just a festival of life. Um, so uh, the, 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 your main question was uh, the stories. There's a million of them, uh, but we've got a new sheriff in town who's adorable and, you know, not much bigger than a chipmunk yeah. and taking care of business. Wow. 
Uh, I, I am blown away by what you've created there, both the garden physically and emotionally and spiritually, the preserve around it, which, you know, is the perimeter and is, as, as you said, is, you know, just a, a, a laboratory of life and, and sustainability and getting rid of the invasives. Uh, any last message? Anything else you want to tell everybody who's watching? Um, please go to, you know, please go visit the Westport Community Gardens website. There's a, a flow code there that'll take you to some information about uh, what we do. It'll take you to the presentation I did for summary. Picture speak, uh, for, uh, that summary I did for the uh, rotary. Um, picture speak a thousand words. So please go look at the uh, Google slideshow and the Shutterfly book. Um, ask for a tour. Um, just, you know, email me at boatdoggy at yahoo.com. Say it again. Boat Doggy, B-O-A-T-D-O-G-G-Y, Boat Doggy at Yahoo.com. I'll be happy to give you a tour of the place. I'm available all summer. Um, you also, or go to the at, Westport Community Gardens website and email me, uh, westportcommunitygardens.org. Is it gardens or garden? Westportcommunitygardens.org. Our email is westportcommunitygarden.com. Um, email me. Email, we'll have somebody meet you there. I'll meet you there. Um, you also said uh, a minute ago, you have done this, you know, created this magical place. It's a, very much a we. There are a lot of people who have their finger in this pot. It is really an incredibly community-built uh, uh, um, situation. It, it's just phenomenal how many people have stepped up to create this unbelievably beautiful legacy town asset. And you really should see it. It's mind-blowing. It's wonderful. Your kids will love it. They will just adore it. And, uh, and um, you know, experience the wonder and the magic of nature and gardens. Lou Weinberg, the uh, chair, director of the Westport Chairman Community. Chairman of the Westport Community Gardens, director of the Long Lost Preserve. You know, yeah, titles, right. whatever. Titles don't mean anything. No. But boy, what, what you've helped create is spectacular. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for sharing it with us and for sharing it with the Westport community and for coming on to today's podcast. Sure. Um, looking forward to seeing everybody at our town party, um, our harvest party. Come sample the wares. I don't know if you can see these, but we've got the freshest produce in town. Do you have a date for the party? Uh, it's looking like August 20th. I'm not positive yet, but we'll get the word out. I will get the word out too. Thanks, man. Thank you, Lou. Okay. Pleasure. <laughs>